Hello, everyone. Uh, please welcome Jay Goyle with his talk, Better Integration Testing with Cucumber. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here at the very last talk after an exhausting day here at PyCon. Uh, my name is Jay, and I'm traveling here from Brooklyn, New York, uh, and I work at a fashion company that, which explains the, the suit and tie and everything really have to represent. I work at a fashion company which does dress rentals. That is, uh, we, you know, if you have a really important event, like a, like a bridesmaids or, or an anniversary party, then you can rent that $600 Hervé Leger gown for $60. Uh, I promise this is not a talk about uh, well, doing the slide. Okay, this is not a talk about fashion, I promise, uh, but uh, the nature of the work that I do uh, lends itself to my motivation for this talk, Better Integration Testing with Cucumber. Because people are renting for these very high stakes events, things that are very important, things that are really emotionally important to our customers, uh, I was really trying to solve the problem of, well, so often we release new features and write new code and we release it and our users don't really understand how to use that feature. They don't really get the value that they want to, or at least that we thought that they would, and we would release things which occasionally did not relieve anxiety for our customers the way we wanted it to. And so I started thinking, okay, well, what can we do as part of our QA process and as part of our uh, sort of release process to try and make that better, to close that gap between uh, what our users are trying to accomplish in their lives and the software that we're writing which is supposed to support that. So one of the tools in my toolbox is Behavioral Driven Development, or BDD. And so the topic of this talk is to describe what BDD is, some of the idioms associated with it, and uh, how to use the libraries and, and, and how to think in this kind of way when we're designing software. Uh, I'm hoping that we will get three major takeaways uh, out of, you know, by the end of this talk. Uh, the first is, you know, I'm hoping that we will be able to increase the quality of our integration tests. I find that when I write software, the things that tend to break the most is not the code that I write, because the code that I write is perfect, but rather the way that my code interacts with other systems, either above or below the stack, or when I'm taking input from users or things like that. So I personally find integration tests to be among the most valuable in my test suite, and I find that uh, Cucumber and the technologies we'll talk about today help me achieve that. And of course, as we would expect with any uh, good testing framework, uh, my goal is always to reduce regressions so that I have confidence that the code for the new feature that I've released today will not break something that was working just yesterday. And the biggest takeaway that uh, I hope to communicate by the end of this presentation is a shift in thinking from not just what is my code supposed to do or how does my software behave, but rather what are my users trying to do uh, and uh, how can I make sure that the software that I'm writing is actually helping my users accomplish what they want to accomplish. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, when I think about testing, I sort of break down tests into three sort of parts of my test. There's the stuff that's gotta happen before my test runs, the thing that I'm testing, and then making sure that whatever I just tested actually works. So here's an example that I lifted basically straight <coughs> out of the Python documentation, uh, and this is a basic unit test for string.split. And we do our setup, so we create the string that we want to test splitting, in this case, hello world. We then perform the split and store those tokens somewhere, and then we have an assertion to make sure that the return value of string.split actually gives us the results that we were expecting. And if I were to then create a Rosetta Stone of uh, these steps of testing to how we, <coughs> how we would typically implement them in a unit test, my preconditions, 
uh, are associated with my setup. Uh, then I have my test methods, followed by some assertions. Nothing too controversial here. Uh, when, I th when we think about BDD, uh, we are thinking about forming our tests, not in the context of, of uh, how the code is supposed to behave, but what users of our code are trying to accomplish. And to do this, we have a domain-specific language. Going back to our little Rosetta Stone, uh, we express preconditions using clauses that begin with the word given. So, given I have a string, hello world, or given I'm a user who is logged into my website. The thing that I'm testing is expressed using when clauses. So, when I split my string, or when I uh, try to view my account information. And uh, my verification is, is uh, denoted by then statements, so then I expect there to be two tokens, hello and world, or then I expect to see my you know, account number or my order history. And so if I were to translate uh, our existing uh, test into this Cucumber domain-specific language, which looks kind of like English, it's not really English, it looks kind of like English, then this is what it would look like. Uh, and I have these neat features here where, for example, because I'm expecting two tokens, I can specify a list of things that I am expecting in an output. So far, I've shown this English-looking thing, this domain-specific language, which describes what the test is supposed to do, but it's not actually testing anything yet, right? Like, there's no actual code which is doing my string comparisons to make sure that, that my code is behaving properly. We will get to that in a second, uh, but I don't see that as the hardest part of this kind of shift in how we think about or describe what our software is supposed to do. So, even before that, some of the advantages that we have here are we have better descriptions of our test cases than maybe we did previously. Uh, in fact, this is something that we already do, which is, and I pulled these two examples from Flask and the request library, where when we have a very complicated test that has a lot of steps, we try to be descriptive by having these really, really long method names that try to describe every little thing about the test behavior. Uh, and by using this Cucumber language, at least we're being a little bit more explicit about what is happening in the test. Uh, the other cool thing here is that when a test breaks and something fails, uh, we often ask ourselves, well, is it the test that's broken or is it my code that's broken? And we've all been in that situation where we see a test that's failing and we go in and we fix the test uh, and then come to realize that, oh, fixing the test was actually the wrong thing to do, uh, but it was easier at the time and we end up you know, actually having regressions. So when we see a failing test in this context, we know what our users were expecting before what we were expecting to happen afterwards, and now as programmers, we have context for how the software was supposed to behave so that we know where to look in the process of debugging. Uh, the other cool thing about this in more of like a business context, or if you work with a lot of non-technical users, is this kind of language forces our non-technical users, say our product managers, to uh, create specifications for software and describe them using similar language that we will use when we eventually write automated tests for that software. Uh, so I find that this approach helps add rigor to specifications and makes them easier to test later down the line. So if we, <coughs> if we look at this uh, using uh, examples from different domains, if you're at Rent the Runway and we have our e-commerce website, then maybe if you're a customer, you expect to go see a list of products and see pictures of dresses on our website. If you're implementing an authentication system, uh, then this is you know, how I would describe how a user would perform authentication. So in this case, uh, I'm not talking about tokens, I'm not talking about encryption, I'm not talking about handshakes or any of that other stuff. All I'm talking about is if I'm a user and I'm trying to log in somewhere, how do I expect the system to behave? Finally, uh, 
let's say I am implementing a library. Let's say the very excellent requests library. Request has this great feature where I can fetch a URL, uh, which, ha which returns JSON, and it will automatically serialize that JSON into a Python dictionary. Uh, so if I were implementing a library for another programmer to use, this is how I might describe uh, the, the functionality in terms of how someone using my library uh, would accomplish their goals. Uh, and request is a very easy example because, <coughs> because the tagline of request is, is just HTTP for humans. So with these different examples, the point that I want to uh, drive home is that now we have a framework for asking ourselves and describing, well, what are our users actually trying to do? Uh, so now let's look at some code. I f have found that there are, there are a lot of libraries that implement this kind of cucumber stuff. Two of them that seem actively maintained uh, and very popular, uh, as defined by lots of stars on GitHub, are uh, Behave, I guess a, a play on behavioral driven development, and Lettuce, because uh, I guess lettuce and cucumbers are both salad related things. For the examples here, I'm going to use the Behave library. I flipped a coin. And, uh, and, and, and these two libraries have very similar syntax, so whichever one you use, it's not so different using one versus the other. So what I've done here is I've taken my string splitting code and I turned it into this file called strings.feature. Uh, .feature is, uh, is a file extension. It, has, you know, it is recognized by GitHub for syntax highlighting and the VI text editor. And uh, I have I've just written it out in this file. Uh, and all of this stuff at the beginning, in order to play with behave as beginners, will implement tests. This is not stuff that is actually executed, uh, but it helps describe the context and what the test is supposed to do. And if I then run the behave command with strings.feature as input, then this is my output. I see that I have a fail test. And Behave tries to execute the first line, given I have a string, hello world. And it says, well, I don't know what this means. I don't have any code which is actually doing anything for my test about the string hello world. It fails the test, and it stops execution. It doesn't execute the rest of the steps. It doesn't even try. And it also does this cool thing where it will give you the actual code that you can copy and paste to fill in and actually implement those tests. So now that we have a failing test, let's try to make those tests pass. Uh, I am now implementing code to be associated with each of the steps of my test. So given I have a string, hello world, uh, I am just assigning that string to this global variable called context. Context uh, is, is, uh, is a variable that exists for the duration of the test, so I can I uh, have information that I'm storing among multiple steps of my test, which I can then reference. And then when I try to split that string, here I'm actually doing the thing that I want to test. I'm splitting the string. Uh, here I've implemented steps for expecting a certain number of tokens, in my case two tokens, and for each token I want to make sure that I have hello and world in that order. When I run behave again with this input, my test pass, everything is green. If my test fails, let's say <laughs> I had an incorrect requirement where I'm expecting one token rather than two tokens, then, uh, then the test would fail at that step. It would provide a traceback, and then I could look and see, hmm, well, what's the problem? It turns out in this case, the problem is that I'm expecting the wrong number of tokens and my test is incorrect, but at least when I read this, I know what the context is and what the right thing to modify uh, would be. The analogy that I want to draw here is to routing in HTTP. If I had a route which displayed uh, information about my user profile, I would define my route, and I would associate that route with a method, which is responsible for actually showing my user information. And 
The cool thing about this is now I get a clean, human readable, readable RESTful route for showing my user's information. And by analogy, I have my human readable requirement, that is, when I view my account information. Uh, and I am easily able to associate that with a piece of code which actually does the test. One of the biggest pitfalls that uh, people make, that I see people make when they're starting out, is they write tests which are really, really granular. That is, they list so many steps that each step basically corresponds to a piece of code which, which would be used on the back end to implement said test. And at this point, we've really uh, missed the forest for the trees, or missed the trees for the forest, or something like that. We uh, have, are not focusing on what our users are trying to accomplish. Instead, we have focused on how the code is supposed to behave at a very granular level. If I were to revise this, uh, this is what I would look like instead, where all of the intermediary steps required to do an automated test here uh, are abstracted away by these higher level behaviors of our user. I think one of the biggest pieces of hype around uh, this kind of stuff, this is the stuff that like agile co consultants will come in and say, they'll say that, oh, all of your non-technical people can write tests. Your product managers can write, to write these tests and write these specifications like Legos and they'll all be polka dots and moonbeams. Do I think this is true? Uh, I say not really. Uh, we know, we all know, that when we're writing tests, we try to write these reusable components, but obviously as our tests change and as the behavior changes, we need developers to go in and make changes to tests. But the advantage that we do get is that now we're at least using a similar language as our non-technical uh, stakeholders um, or as our non-technical users to think about and describe how a system is supposed to behave. Uh, and I believe that we get advantages and better outcomes of closing that gap between what we actually want and the software that gets written by using similar language. Uh, I want to use a real example from Rent the Runway. This is highly proprietary code, so please nobody tell anyone outside this room what I'm about to show you, of some actual scenarios that we have. Uh, these are things that have to run, and they have to pass before we release any code uh, to our website uh, and, uh, and, and so we run these many, many times every day. This is actually, I copied it and pasted from GitHub this morning, this is what the account creation scenario looks like in our integration tests. And the code on the back end, now this is written in Ruby because our storefront code is written in Ruby, uh, is what does the, the nitty gritty work of of you know, filling it, we're using Copybar to fill in those login forms uh, and actually affect that test. And we even have a Jenkins plugin which will aggregate all of those tests and tell us exactly what is passing and what is failing. Uh, so, <coughs> you know, in terms of key takeaways, uh, I think the biggest takeaway is that well, we should focus on what users are trying to do not what we want our code to do. Uh, I wanted to introduce this given, when, then idiom for describing uh, the behavior of our software. Uh, we can construct these things in a way that are reusable. For example, the login functionality or creating new account functionality is something that we can use across all of our tests. Uh, and it is helpful to think about uh, actually implementing these things the same way we think about routing and how we have a separation of concerns there. And I find it tremendously helpful to be able to write my acceptance criteria and my tests and my specifications uh, in a way which is more accessible to people who are non-technical. I find that, that leads to better outcomes. Uh, so that is all I have. Uh, if you have questions or particularly hairy or difficult scenarios, that you, uh, that you wanna to try to stump me on to convert those into uh, you know, cucumber scenarios, then I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, otherwise, I very much appreciate everyone coming out. So yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, please come to the microphone. 
Thank you very much for the um, talk there, Jay. It's very good. Um, I was just quite kind of interested to see that you're using Cucumber rather than um, going for something like Behave, which you showed there. What was the reason for using uh, Cucumber rather than Behave? Um, so I didn't quite hear your question, but tell me so, if I was correct. Sorry, I was just saying, why did you use um, Cucumber rather than Behave as your test tool? I was just, because obviously Cucumber is written in um, Ruby, mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering whether you would preferred using Ruby for that, or what was the reason for not using Behave? Because I'm looking at using Behave at the moment, and I'm... Sure. So the question out. is, so on the one hand, Cucumber is already there as one library, mm. and here I chose to use Behave as the library. Mm. What was the motivation for that? Mm. So I believe... Oh, so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the, Q, the official Cucumber people who make that Cucumber package uh, do not support Python as one of their uh, languages. They support Ruby. I think they support a couple of different languages. Hmm. So Behave is just, the, is just one of the, I guess, unofficial Python implementations. Yeah, it's, it's a port. It's a port. Yes, um, yep. So, yeah. Okay. So, Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, could you talk about, um, so sometimes people uh, implement this BDD and it ends up being, um, hey, we'll have our business analysts write all these tests and it just ends up being the coders having to rewrite all these cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering if um, you see that too and if um, how this is better, or how, the, how this sort of holds the hand with uh, unit testing mm -hmm. as, a, as a practice. And so I'll try to restate your first question, which is, you know, it feels like a little bit of a slog to have to implement all of these Cucumber tests for all of our features, when, especially if we're already using unit tests. So how do we reconcile that, and like, what is our strategy for implementing this without spending all of our time just writing tests. Is that, what's this? Yeah. So uh, my perspective on this is, you know, if so often the case this is something that's gonna happen later in the process. Uh, now, if everyone wrote their tests at the beginning of a project, then, you know, everything would be polka dots and moonbeams. So my approach to this is, you know, you can make a list of all of the different acceptance tests that you wanna write and then do some sort of division and do a certain number week over week. Uh, that feels very painful. So my approach is let's focus on the happy paths first. So let's take some of the major uses of our software, let's not try to get all the edge cases, and prioritize doing those first. So basic login, you know, basic you know, use cases. The second thing then is uh, as we create bugs, uh, which I never do, but uh, we write failing tests for those bugs. So rather than trying to capture all the edge cases and everything all at once, focus on flows which are really, really important, the critical paths to begin with, and then for subsequent changes and new features and bug fixes, then do those tests as we go along to decrease the pain. Does that answer your question? I, yes, I think that that does um, provide better. Um, I think that does provide context. I, I just worry that um, these are just going to end up that it isn't the users or the business analysts that end up writing all the mm -hmm. the Skirkin language, the 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 given then when that it ends up being the programmers anyway. Yeah, and that that's just another level of frustration when they could just be writing the unit tests and something that's sort of native in terms of their thinking process? Yeah, my uh, experience has been that the frustration comes less from actually writing these tests, because we're writing the same code, and whether I'm writing the code in a unit test method versus a cucumber method doesn't really make a big difference. The pain is in working with that product person to figure out exactly what that syntax should be. And I think the argument that I'm making uh, is that that pain is is actually quite useful in making sure that 
we close that gap between what product wants and what developers are going to build way earlier in the process rather than ha after having implemented something which doesn't, which, which, you know, may not quite match what we were expecting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, the lightning talks will be starting in three minutes. Thank you, Jay, for your talk. And okay. everyone who has questions, please uh, address them personally. I'll be down, so if you want to catch me, then I'm happy to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.